Welcome everyone. My name is Chris Edgar and I'm the Chief Science Officer with Cogstate. I had the pleasure of uh, catching up with my colleague Eric Seamus, who's our Distinguished Medical Advisor, following his attendance at the recent CTAD meeting. With over 1,000 in-person attendees, CTAD this year marked a welcome return to live scientific debate and was at a key moment for the field. So it was a real pleasure to be able to catch up with Eric um, to uh, discuss his experiences of attending the meeting and some key highlights as unfortunately I wasn't able to be there in person myself. It appears to be an emerging consensus that the monoclonal antibodies as a class may be positively affecting both amyloid and clinical progression. What do you think we learned from CTAD about future directions for drug development? I think across the board there's a growing acceptance that these monoclonal antibodies that uh, target plaque and reduce plaque are having an effect on disease progression. So there's now uh, a fair amount of evidence on three different monoclonal antibodies, uh, aducanumab uh, being one, lecanemab, uh, the ASI um, monoclonal being another, and then uh, the, the newest one, uh, denanumab uh, from uh, Eli Lilly. So we actually saw some new data on aducanumab showing that uh, not only does it reduce plaque, but it also reduced um, uh, phosphotau in blood. So that's a downstream effect. Um, and uh, denanumab had some very similar data where they show quite dramatic plaque reduction. But in addition to that, they had this decrease in phosphotau in, in blood, which is downstream from uh, amyloid, at least that's the, the current thinking. So I think those two pieces of evidence, in addition to the effect on slowing disease progression as determined by clinical measures, really starts to give some consistency so that even though these are kind of first generation treatments and they may not be, well, they're not perfect because they have side effects like RE associated with them, but we are seeing a signal and we are moving the needle. And I think that consistency across three different antibodies uh, is important. And I think that came through with the meeting. Um, we saw two, um, a, a number of different study designs presented um, for planned clinical trials. And Within these Cogstate computerized tests being included as exploratory or secondary outcomes in both the, the Acumen early phase trial and also the Lilly Trailblazer 3, what, what are your thoughts there around the inclusion of uh, novel digital tools in these trials and what might be motivating sponsors to include these? Well, as you know, Chris, this, this field is just exploding right now, but there are so many different ways you can use these uh, digital biomarkers, as they're sometimes called. So they can be used as inclusion exclusion criteria to help you identify the right patients. Now, those patients may end up uh, eventually having an amyloid PET scan or other things to look at them. But if you can uh, enrich the population for people who do have a positive PET scan, that's really an important uh, uh, aspect to uh, doing clinical trials. And then secondly, as you point out, you can use these um, digital biomarkers as outcome measures. Now, I think we're probably uh, a long ways away from having regulators accept those as a primary outcome in a pivotal trial. That may eventually happen someday. But I think where we are right now is to use those in phase two or maybe even phase three studies as secondary outcomes. So these things, as they rapidly evolve, appear to have uh, really quite good uh, signal to noise ratio, essentially. So signal detection, uh, detecting drug effects. And so especially in a phase two study, which, of course, tends to be smaller, not as much statistical powering. If you can use a tool like this to get uh, a sense that your drug is having a biologic effect, um, that's an important piece of inf information. And, and that perhaps provides us with a, a neat segue into your presentation, um, the, the invited session that you gave at the working group prior to the meeting. And, and there you were invited to present on the combination of cognitive assessment and, and blood-based myomarkers to 
support AD diagnosis. Yeah, we, we know that there's a lot of interest in that space. And we, we heard to an update from the BioFinder cohort during the main meeting, exploring this idea in their own data. What do you see as being the next steps in the field for determining and validating a, a cost-effective and accurate diagnostic workflow, um, which combines good cognition and, and blood-based biomarkers? And how should we be thinking about the, the design and conduct of these studies? Well, yeah, so there's two different aspects of that. And uh, these were both discussed at what's called this task force meeting, which is a little satellite meeting that's always held before CTAD. Um, but to focus maybe on how these things might be used in clinical practice, which I think is similar to how you could use them in a, in a trial, but let's just think about clinical practice. Um, it, it's interesting that people who work on digital biomarkers, uh, typically cognitive tests that are, are computerized, uh, tend to focus, of course, on, on, on what they're doing. People who are working, especially recently on the blood-based biomarkers, get really focused on um, uh, the blood-based biomarker and maybe just even one of those. But there was a recent publication based on data from the BioFinder uh, study that you uh, brought up where, and this I don't think should be surprising, is you actually got the best result if you used a blood biomarker in combination with a cognitive test, which obviously could be uh, computerized. So using the two of those together gives you a better result than either one of them individually. So then the question becomes, what's the order? Which one do you do first? What's, how much do they cost? Um, if you have expensive blood tests and an expensive cognitive test, and then you're gonna use both of those that's probably not going to fly with, with payers um, worldwide, actually. But I think it's uh, probably more likely that the digital biomarker cognitive tests could be done less expensively. So if that's your first screen, and then let's just say half of the people based on their score on that test, then go on to a blood test, and assuming the blood test isn't too expensive, then you've really started to limit the cost to the payers. So there's a lot of things that are in evolution here, uh, especially in terms of the costs of, well, the costs of the cognitive testing and the cost of the uh, blood test. So a lot of things in motion right now, but um, I think there's a, a, a good understanding and consensus that however you do this it needs to be cost effective and so we have to be smart about how we use these two things together